You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Uncle Simon, do you want your hot chocolate upstairs? Uncle Simon, I have your tray. Can you hear me? I said, do you want your hot chocolate upstairs? Garbage head, I'm right here. You don't have to yell. Oh, I just scared the, the life out of me. Oh, did I? Where were you? In the basement, of course. Where else would I be? You told me you were going to take your afternoon nap. And I shall, after I finish my work, as usual. Well, my wilted blossom, what's on your mind? Anything? Your hot chocolate's ready. So I gather. I'll take it in the study. That's fine, Uncle. But you know, you might try extending yourself sometime. Just sufficiently to let me know where you are. Well, I can narrow it down for you, Barbara, my love. If I'm not upstairs in my bedroom, I'm downstairs in my laboratory. In either case, you simply bring the hot chocolate to one place or the other. Clear? Utterly. And if I'm in neither place, that means I drop dead en route. And you can just bring me a bottle of formaldehyde and a rose. You have such a sense of humor, Uncle. You should have tried stand-up comedy. No, wait. They didn't have comedy clubs in your day, did they? Burlesque, then. You could have gone into burlesque. A regular George Burns. <sighs> That's an idea. I dare say I, I should have been a bit more comfortable than you in such a setting. Do you even know how to dance, Barbara? Uncle Simon. Not necessarily as a headliner like, say, Gypsy Rose Lee. In the chorus, perhaps. That might be more your style. Ever let yourself loose? Oh, for a fast Charleston? Uncle Simon, I am very busy. No, I didn't think so. Most unlikely. You're the only woman I know who looks as if underneath her clothes she wears more clothes. You have all the grace and femininity of a high-buttoned shoe. And you, Uncle Simon. What about... Yes? Never mind. Go on, my dear. Speak it out. Let's see. If you can compensate for the fact that you're a passionless vegetable by at least speaking your mind. If I'm a passionless vegetable, it's because my gardener is an ancient relic made out of dry skin and ice water. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Not bad at all. If I prod you enough, you can scrabble up to the occasion at least part way. <laughs> what else is new with you, my angular turnip? You say you've made hot chocolate? That's a start, I suppose. To what other soul-stirring projects have you applied your talents today? I noticed you tried to open up the drapes in the bedrooms and the hall. And I noticed you closed them. What are you afraid of? Afraid, my dear? What do you think could happen to you if you ever got hit by fresh air and sunlight? Think you might shrivel up and blow away like a vampire? My, my, my. Is that your fantasy? That I'm from Transylvania? Sorry to disappoint you. No such luck, I'm afraid. What would happen if we fumigated this old house and got rid of all the medicine smells and the chemical smells? You're referring, I take it, to these test tubes. An important part of my research, as you well know. Then why keep them in the study with the Wedgwood and the Dresden China? They must be here. They indicate changes in the moisture content of the air. What changes? The only changes here is that the air turns from stale to musty to plain old mildew. 
pretty soon I won't be able to breathe it at all. Why, you poor suffocating spinster. I didn't realize how affected you were by the life of relative ease you enjoy. Entirely at my expense, I might add. You ask what I've done today? All right. Here's the answer. I cleaned up after you. First, last, and in between. I cleared away, or tried to clear, the debris you leave behind. And to understand how anybody who's earned all these diplomas and awards can be so sloppy. This one, for example. Honorary degree for sound transmission. God only knows what that one was for. And what's this contraption on your desk? A room straightener, maybe? That's one thing you should have invented. Now tell me, where does this thing belong? Leave it exactly where it was, Barbara. Oh, oh. would you have noticed the difference? Would you really? You've been told a thousand times not to disturb anything. I could have put it away when I swept the cellar, except that, as usual, your laboratory was securely bolted. Someday I'd like to see what it is you putter around with down there. I bet you would. And someday you shall. Someday you'll be the mistress of this decaying and drafty barn, and then you can do anything you please. But for the moment, you'll keep your spindle-shanked carcass out of my laboratory, and that long, thin, probing proboscis of yours away from my business. Gladly. Now get me some fresh hot chocolate. Put it in the English cup today, and if it's not hot, I'll throw it on the floor, and you'll have even more to clean up. Dramatist Persona, Mr. Simon Polk, a gentleman who has lived out his life in gleeful rage, and the young lady who just now beat a hasty retreat is Mr. Polk's niece, Barbara. She lives each hour of her life as if perpetually late for a dentist's appointment. And there is yet a third member of the company soon to be seen, he now resides downstairs in the laboratory, and he is, well, the kind of character you'd expect to find only in the Twilight Zone. And now, back to the Twilight Zone with Uncle Simon, starring Beverly Garland and Peter Mark Richman, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. I'll make you some fresh chocolate. Barbara! Uncle. Question. Yes. A point of information. Go on. Perhaps you can enlighten me. If all you've said is true, why do you stay here? I was under the impression I was needed. You are. That answer explains why I keep you here. It doesn't even remotely suggest why you stay. <sighs> you want it quite honestly, I presume. Indeed. You may be short on beauty, my dear. But a lack of candor is not one of your deficiencies. I stay. I live for the moment that I can see you buried. And on the day when I come back from your funeral, I'll open up a bottle of wine. I want to be compensated, Uncle Simon, for 25 years of being shrieked at, insulted, berated, humiliated, stepped on, ground underfoot like this old rug. Is that sufficiently honest for you? Mm-hmm. I wish you well, good and faithful Barbara. And I won't even come back to haunt you by word on that. But unasked, I offer the following observation free of charge. Oh. I can hardly wait. If you had an ounce of gristle or an inch of intestine, you would have murdered me years ago. So as to your 25 years of abject misery and unspeakable indignation, life has a way of dishing out justice. In other words, you deserve it, kid. Now play your role and get me my hot chocolate before I think of something more complicated for you to do. <laughs> uh. 
Dear Uncle Simon. And where are you now, you old... Ah, of course. Downstairs in your laboratory, as you call it. Where else? And what do you do in there, dear uncle? I mean, if I could see for myself just a glimpse, just once, so I'll know. Oh, did you leave the door unlocked this time? Well, now, what have we here? Uh, I was... I, I was I was looking for looking for what? I I thought perhaps you you'd show me what you're building. <laughs> Indeed, you'd love to know that, wouldn't you? Well, I'm sure it's it's something impressive. My curiosity got the better of me. That's the one character trait you share with normal women: curiosity, an ineffable and insatiable curiosity. Well, remember what it did for the proverbial cat. One of these days, you're going to find out what I'm building. I'm sure I will, Uncle, whenever you're ready. But for the time being, you night-crawling imitation of the female gender, if I catch you sneaking around outside my door again, I'll break your head with a broom handle or one of these canes. Now go back upstairs and engage yourself in a nerve-wracking game of dominoes. With pleasure. Now, go on. Tell me, Uncle Simon. What? Tell me why it is that beasts like you stay alive for so long. How's, how's that again? You heard me. Why do some men have the decency to die when their time is up, while brute animals like yourself continue on and on? <laughs> indeed, why indeed. That bit of curiosity I shall be glad to satisfy. In most cases, particularly mine, we have something to live for. An overarching purpose that keeps us going. Oh? And what would that be? I have you to live for, you crooked-seamed grubber. I keep this decrepit heart beating and these over-the-hill lungs breathing because I know how deeply dedicated you are to the one sight that will be your ultimate reward. And what sight is that? Seeing me die. Who came here 25 years ago when you were crippled and sick and couldn't take care of yourself? Who moved in and nursed you and kept you alive? You did! That's right! Me! And no one else! You, you scrounging female ape. Now let's get down to cases. The question is, why did you? Why would you out of familial love, was it, Barbara? Out of a palpitating compassion? Out of a flagpole stiff loyalty? I'll tell you why you came, why you nursed, and why you stayed, you covetous crank. Go ahead, enlighten me. There's no mystery, no mystery at all. You came because you knew that when I depart, I'll leave everything behind to you by default. My only living relative. Everything. You stayed on day after day and year after year because every prayer that came out of your tight little mouth was a supplication that I'd be dead the next morning. A brilliant deduction. So don't go mouthing sweetness at me, you thin-lipped, toothpick-legged conover. I wouldn't think of it. Anything you did for me, you did out of greed, naked and unadorned. Don't tell me different. Stay away from me. Greed, Miss Barbara, greed. So big, so thick, so heavy, it blotted out even that delicious hate you've been carrying around inside. I said stay back. Well, let me tell you something, you money-sick crone. You'll get paid off in due time. Before that, you'll pay through every one of your pores for what I leave you. Don't you raise your cane to me. You'll pay, you ugly harpy. As God is my witness, How you'll... dare you! What are you? What are you doing? Give me that cane! Barbara! Don't! Barbara! <laughs> ah! Uncle? Barbara! What? Barbara, help me. What, Uncle? Barbara, Barbara, please! I didn't quite hear you. 
I think... Speak a little louder, would you, Uncle? Tell me, what is it you wanted? I think my back is broken. What's that? You want some hot chocolate? Would you like it in the Dresden cup? Or the Wedgwood? What is your pleasure this evening, Uncle? Barbara! You say you want me to close the drapes and shut the windows? Barbara. Barbara? You want Barbara? She's right here, love. She's standing right above you. Can't you see her? Please. Can't you hear her? You ancient albatross with the dirty, dirty mouth? Oh, but you're so pale. Let me pinch some color back into your cheeks. No. There now. That's better. How does that feel? Uncle Simon. Oh, Uncle Simon, don't die quite yet. If you can hold out, try. Try just for a second. I want to tell you something. I want to make an announcement. As of this second, I have quit suffering for you. I'm no longer sewing, Uncle Simon. As of right now, I'm going to reap! Are you comfortable, Mr. Schwimmer? Uh, what? Oh, yes. Thank you, Miss Polk. I'll just be another moment. I, uh, I cleaned off my uncle's desk for you. Yes, yes. You've kept the house in splendid condition, by the way. It looks different somehow. Oh, I, I've made a few changes. Marvelous taste you have, I must say. If you need pencils or pens, they're in the top drawer. No, no, the will is relatively simple. I only want to make sure I brought the latest amendments, signed and notarized. But I thought he drew it up years ago. It's been in the safe deposit box for as long as I can remember. The original copy, yes. Your uncle had me drafted shortly after you came to stay with him. He added a codicil or two later on, hence this revised copy. Oh, really? I wasn't aware of that. Assets, real property. Uh -huh. Everything seems to be in order. Oh, there's, there's no need to read it aloud, Mr. Schwimmer. If you can just give me the sense of it so I'll know how to dispose of his things. That, my dear, won't be necessary. I beg your pardon? That is the sense of it. What do you mean? The will very explicitly requires that you throw away nothing, that you keep everything as it was, intact. I see. The house... The furnishings, everything, it all goes to you in perpetuity. With the proviso, of course, that you remain here in perpetuity, as it were. Do you have any objection to that? Why, I have no other place to go, Mr. Schwimmer. This has become my home. <clears throat> of, of course, of course. So, the document is quite clear in its intent. Everything will remain in your name as long as you are on the premises. The same thing applies to the various securities in the cash account, which is quite sizable. It has been set up as a trust in your name. You're to draw all the interest accruing so long as you remain in the house. Where could anyone... Where could anyone ever find a man with a heart as big as he is? Uh, quite so. Is there more? Hmm... Well, the sense of this, Miss Polk, is that to qualify for your inheritance, there is one additional stipulation. What kind of stipulation? That you're to care for your uncle's latest experiment. Hmm. Care for? That's odd. I don't understand it, Mr. Schwimmer. Which experiment? I have no idea. But it reads as follows. 
My beloved niece, Barbara, will be responsible for the well-being of my latest experiment. She will care for it, look after it, and see to its wants and needs. What wants and needs? A member of the law firm of Schwimmer, Schwimmer, King, Bartlett, Kaplan, and Schwimmer will visit the domicile once each week to see that this stipulation is adhered to. In the event my beloved niece Barbara fails to comply with the provisions herein, I hereby give and bequeath all my property, both real and personal, to the state university. Uh Uh-huh. Now, the sense of that, Miss Polk... Tell me, Mr. Schwimmer, what is the sense of that? I gather it depends very much on the nature of your uncle's experiment, which he refers to only as it. I take it you have no idea what it might be? None at all, except that whatever it is, it's in the basement. Where are you going? What do you think? To the laboratory. Oh, wait, you'll need the keys. He always kept it locked. Your uncle was a genius. I'm sure he didn't want his work to fall into the wrong hands. Not even mine. A matter of national security, perhaps. (sighs) At last. His inner sanctum. Not particularly foreboding. I must say, it looks like any research lab at the university. With a few pieces of gear I haven't seen before. He was always ordering new parts, all the latest test equipment. And you don't know what he was testing? He chose not to share that bit of information with me. To protect you, I'm sure. But we'll know soon enough. What's behind that other door? Where? Against the wall, at the back of the room. I don't know. Do you have the other key? It must be the large one. How this relates to his will, though, I'm not at all sure. Ah, now, this piece, this is interesting. Looks like a metal glove. I wonder what it does. I wouldn't touch it if I were you. Why, it's part of a mechanical hand with an arm attached. I said don't touch it. Sorry. Good good Lord. There's something attached to the arm. It appears to be a complete metal figure of some sort in the shape of a man. It must be eight feet tall. I think we better go now. How do you do? What? What are you? In your lexicon, I am a robot. I was created by the great scientist Simon Polk. You have activated my selecting and operating relays. You stay away from me. I mean you no harm. Please be patient with me. My program requires several days to function at maximum capacity. I bid you greetings. Hello, Barbara. Barbara. Now what? Barbara. Is that you, Barbara? Yes, it's me. Who else would it be? Are you going out, Barbara? It happens that I am. Why are you sitting here in the study with all the lights off? I do not like the light. This is a more restful mode while I program my circuits. Where are you going? To a concert. A concert? Do you know how long it's been since I went to a concert? No, I do not have that information. But I estimate the answer to be several years. Several? Try twenty. What is a concert? It's a... a beautiful musical experience. Inspiring. But you wouldn't know anything about that. What is music? It's when people, real human beings, use instruments handmade out of metal or wood to create sounds that are pleasing to the ear. The human ear. They should use only metal parts. Wood decays. 
It does not have the durability of metal alloy. It is an inferior building material. Well, here's a flash for you, young Frankenstein. They use horsehair, too. Dead organic material for the string section. And you know something? It sounds absolutely heavenly. Not like some tin can that got left out in the rain. I see. Do you? I doubt it. I'm going now. If you need anything, like a shot of oil on the rocks, you can get it yourself. You mustn't leave. Are you telling me what to do? Mr. Schwimmer is coming tonight. A week has gone by. Isn't that correct? Yes, Mr. Schwimmer is coming. He'll be here at 8 o'clock after I'm gone. So you just sit tight. Good. Good? Good for what? He will check my condition. He will see that I am functioning properly. That's right. Maybe he'll give you a lube and an oil change while he's at it. You see, Barbara, I am like... like an infant... I mature gradually. Soon I will have all my faculties. I will be able to perform all my faculties and functions. I will be a whole being. Oh, how nice. How perfectly grand for you. You'll be a whole being. And then what? Or can you think that far? I will take on human attributes, those that your Uncle Simon saw fit to give me. Oh, that'll be an improvement, because he certainly didn't see fit to give you any human attributes so far. You look like something out of an old science fiction movie, or the uh, Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz. (laughs) You're a joke. Joke? Ah, I understand your meaning. Simon Polk was known for his sense of humor. He could have been a comedian. Uncle Simon? Oh, yeah. Hysterical. The crown prince of comedy. Bye now, Tin Man. Wait. This is interesting. This is very interesting. It is coming through now. What is? A craving. A new craving. A craving? As in hunger? For a machine that doesn't eat? Hot, hot chocolate. A beverage made from dried cocoa beans and sugar. I would love a cup of hot chocolate. How do you do, Miss Polk? I hope I'm not late. Late? My, you look outstanding in that dress. And those earrings. I've never seen you looking quite so... so outstanding. Were you going somewhere? No. I wasn't going anywhere. Not anywhere at all. And how, may I ask, is our young Master Polk doing this evening? Right this way. We've been waiting for you in the study. Frankenstein? Where are you? (laughs) Didn't even drink your chocolate, did you? No, of course not. And you spilled it, just so I'd have something to clean up. What are you doing down there? Hello, Barbara. I was looking through my laboratory. Your laboratory? That is correct. You better be careful, Frankenstein, or I'll leave you outside to rust. Now go upstairs and sit in your chair and be quiet. As soon as I lock the door... Wait a minute. Those keys? You took them off the desk. 
Give them back to me. Oh no. Oh no, Barbara. I must keep the laboratory locked. And you mustn't come down. It's my room. It belongs to me. Won't you bring me some more hot chocolate? So that's how it is now. <sighs> All right. All right. If that's what it takes. Barbara. What did you say? Barbara. After you bring me my hot chocolate, would you please close all the windows and pull the drapes? I don't like the light. I don't like the draft. The air inside has been carefully monitored for proper moisture content to prevent corrosion. That voice is not possible. What is the matter, Barbara? Tell me, please. What is the matter? What is the matter? What is the matter, you peanut-headed sample of nature's carelessness? You! Get away from me! Barbara, I Barbara, Barbara, my legs, they're, they're bent. I can't get up. Barbara, help me. There you are. I was wondering where you'd gone to. I brought you some tea. Oh, thank you. That's lovely. But I'm afraid I can't stay. No? Another engagement, alas. Tell me, how are you, Miss Polk? I mean, really. Fine. Thank you, Mr. Schwimmer. Glad to hear it. He... It is rather quiet these days. Doesn't seem to say much, even after all these weeks. He makes his wants known. Pity about his... his legs. But he manages to get around, doesn't he? Indeed he does. Indeed he does. Well, I'll see you next week then. Yes, of course. And the week after. And the week after that. Take care of yourself, my dear. No need to show me out. Barbara! Here! In the study! Barbara, my dear, if you can prevail upon that raggedy and carcass of yours to exert yourself, I'd like a cup of hot chocolate. I would like it in a Wedgwood cup. And if it's not sufficiently hot, I'll pour it on the floor at your feet. Clear? All right. I'll make some. Speak up, you lint-headed clod. I didn't hear you. I'll make some hot chocolate. Do that, you torpid lotus eater. And be sure that it's hot. Did you hear me? Make sure it's hot. What does it take to make you move, you arthritic crab? I'll... I'll fix it for you now. You'll fix it for me now what? I'll fix it for you now, Uncle. That's better. I'll be at my desk, working on my notes. Yes, Uncle. Dramatis Personae, a metal man who will henceforth go by the name of Simon, whose life, as well as his body, have been stamped out for him by his maker and the woman who tends to his needs, the Lady Barbara, who has discovered, somewhat belatedly, that not all bad things come to an end and that once a bed is made, it may be necessary to sleep in it after all. This, our uncomfortable little exercise in avarice and automatons from the Twilight Zone.
Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download-only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered, while supplies last, at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often, and I'll see you in the zone. Uncle Simon, starring Beverly Garland and Peter Mark Richmond with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Turk Muller, Doug James, and Daniel Bryant. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. Thank <laughs> you.